Well, hello again. Today I'd like to talk about something I call Now What? Uh, this is actually the third of three books I wrote. The first was called Intervention. Uh, it's the way I like to talk with uh, most people when I first sit down with them. Uh, if you need more information on interventions, you would go to How I Met Your Mother. I think they do a very funny job with it. Uh, Quintervention being perhaps my favorite. Uh, very simply, it's the idea of you sit down with somebody and you kind of tell them the truth. And that's a tough thing. The second book was Can You Go? And it's the way I assess everybody else, plus my basic assessment for athletes. And the third book was Now What? Once we've gone through the assessment, once we've performed as athletes, now what? Now, all this experience comes from athletics. But what I try to do is apply what I learn in athletics to what everybody else can do too. So let's just do a quick basic overview of the concept of intervention. Can you go? And then lead into a deeper discussion on now what? In the original book, Intervention, and I have a picture of the Hungarian edition of the book, uh, I had 10 questions that I sit down and ask everybody about. And, and at the time, that was true. But almost the moment the book was published, I realized that really there's only three questions. And in a way, there's only one. But let's go through those three and we'll, we'll talk about it. The first thing I always ask people is, what's your goal? Now, listen, I'm a big believer that the process, the, the ritual, the, the daily doing of something is far more important than this far off goal. If you take care of the process, the result takes care of itself. But it's important when you first talk to somebody to find out if they have a performance goal or a vague other thing. Athletes are easy. If you throw the discus 180, that's who you are. That is your A. Your goal now becomes 190. That is your B. A to B. And the two part, uh, the TO, is the, the program you put together, the exercises you choose, the nutritional program, the sleep, everything else. If quickly you're a 180 foot thrower and all of a sudden you do a lot of these things and all of a sudden you're throwing 140, well, there's a problem here. There's something going wrong. But if you go 180, 184, 187, 188, then you can say, you know, things are going pretty well here. The other goal comes from a good friend, Steve Ledbetter. And it's this thing that most people do when you ask them what your goal is. They get very vague and they get very... Well, it took us a while to figure out what was going on. But basically, and as I say this in another video, most people really want to tell you this simple thing. You see this person here? It's not me. I'm young, I'm good looking, I have, you know, I, I can stay up all night, work all day, party all night, work all day, and I can just keep doing that for weeks at a time. So in other words, with most people, the goal kind of is, see this? That's not me. That opened my head up to simplifying the entire process, and it led us directly into the one, two, three, four assessment because we need to find out what is the first thing we can really deal with for you to get you on the right track to being, well, instead of not you, you. The second question is something I still think is important. I don't think people appreciate it as much. Will this goal expand your life for the better in most ways? You know, there are some goals you can have that might not make your life better. And I think I think it takes a some serious reflection and honest insight to say, you know what, if I do this, then all these other areas of my life will get better. The example I always use is uh, my decision to go to Utah State to throw the discus. Um, I look now 40 plus years later and I realize that every aspect of my life got better because of that decision. The pressures of high level competition, the uncomfortableness of going to a place you know no one, literally knew no one, and having to perform at the highest level, one of the highest levels in the world. Well, now I can look back and realize that achieving that goal and going on the journey towards that goal 
was a life changer for me. And the last question, uh, and this is, I use this for a lot of purposes, is how old are you? Uh, some people will say, well, I'm 72. And your goal is to play in the National Football League? Well, that was my goal. Well, okay, you're too old. Or if you're past age 22 and you're not making a living as a professional athlete, there's a good chance that that ship has sailed. But the most important thing about this question is this. Next year, you're going to be a year older. If you decide to go get another degree and it's going to take you four years, in four years, that four years is going to come whether or not you have that degree. So I'm very persuasive in my encouragement to people to get started now. Let's look at the now what matrix. So the very first question we ask, and it's important that you see this basically as a, a series of switches, if you will. If then, if then, if then. When we ask, what's your goal? Uh, let's slide over uh, first to you're an A, not a client, a typical person, or somebody we call everybody else's or E squareds. Then almost immediately, I ask you to do this very simple assessment that you'll see in Can You Go called the one, two, three, four assessment. And we find where you are in this Venn diagram here. And as we're looking at that Venn diagram, we determine if you're one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. And then what we start to look for is the minimum effective dose for your most glaring issue. Now, for some people, your most glaring issue is you need to go see a medical doctor. Other people might have to go see a, a medical doctor, a dentist, and an eye doctor. Other people might need to lift weights. Other people might need to do caloric restriction. It just depends on what happens with the assessment. And I break the set, the, the, the Venn diagram is based on three big circles, mobility, which is one, body comp, which is three, strength, which is five, and then the others are where the, the, the Venn diagram does the work. Most of the time, we focus on health and longevity for people in this area. Uh, and I really try to emphasize to them two things. The thing we call shark habits. One bite and they're gone. I got that from Rob Wolf. And the idea with shark habits is anything in your life that you can check a box, say yes or no, that's a shark habit. I think you should have a weekly menu. I think you should have a weekly chore list. Uh, I think it's a great idea to have an annual checklist around the house for things to do around the house so that when a certain month comes along like May, here are the things I need to do for May and try to get them done on May 1st. Um, I have discovered in my life that I'm a much better writer when I cut out the number of decisions I make in a day, which is why I always wear the same shirt. For things that are your goal, uh, these are the things you need to do to kind of turn your life around to undo the not meanness. Then we give you a pirate map, a list of three, five, at most eight things that you'll do each and every day. And like brick upon brick, brick upon brick, you will build the Great Wall of China, which will get you to your goal. People underappreciate how much can be done day by day. Now, on the other hand of the now what matrix is active athletes. With active athletes, things are pretty simple. The assessment is, can you go? Well, did you? Can you? How'd you do? 80% um, of the time when you train with me, I would like you to focus on what you said your goal was. If you're uh, swimmer, swim, jumpers, jump, hurdlers, hurdle, sprinter, sprint, throwers, throw. And the rest of the time, you should be doing some simple, and I, I write here, easy strength, but a program that gets you as strong as we can get you, as easy as we can get you. And in the area of performance, which we'll go into some depth here on this particular discussion, that's when things like peaking, planning, programming, and principles show up. But the most important of that list of P's is principles. What is the core thing you need to do to get your goals? So for me, there's a weird little athletic continuum I try to explain to young coaches, and it doesn't always work as well as I hope. 
on this example here, red is what the athlete does and black is what the coach does. The athlete's job first is to train appropriate to the goal. And right there, I could have a seven hour conversation about that might be as important as anything I said. Um, when I find out that a high jumper uh, injured his ankle playing in a church basketball league because he's so good. Oh, by the way, it was the week before the nationals and it cost him a national championship. I'm wondering if a pickup, well, a church league basketball game was worth it. Uh, you hear about, uh, I saw a, an injury years ago uh, of a downhill skier who got hurt because the, the athlete was asked to jump up on a BOSU ball and the athlete missed and crashed in the ground and hurt their ankle. You got to train appropriate to the goal. The coach's job is to focus really, I think, on three things. Number one, of course, and this is overwhelmingly the most important, repetition, repetition, repetition. Sign language is repetition, repetition, repetition. Simplicity, the coach's job is to take out all the noise that you possibly can and simplify, simplify. And the third one comes, comes from John T. Reed. He calls it gravity. And the idea of gravity is your job as a coach is to find those few things that can make or break a championship and you really focus on on that and you make sure the athlete knows the importance of certain things uh, it can be it, it can be just about anything depending on the sport but i found that uh, as an american football coach there are certain plays that you may only run a few times a year but we would practice those at least weekly as a discus thrower instead of giving the thrower the appropriate six number of throws and you know in a competition we would have one throw competitions to teach the athlete to deal with the pressure of just one throw. Athlete job number two is you got to show up at the competition. My job at the competition is to walk up to you and say, can you go? And the answer is yes or no. I don't want to hear about the fact there wasn't enough bagels for breakfast. You didn't sleep well enough. Uh, you didn't have your magic supplement. You didn't have, can you go? Yes or no. Then the athlete's job is to compete. And then I think something we need to do is after competition, we ask the question, now what? And it doesn't matter if the athlete just won the gold medal at the Olympics or broke the world record. Our job is to start talking about the next step. Now, in some cases, the next step, uh, step is retirement. And personally, I would still like to be part of that discussion for the athlete. So, because I would like to send them off to a phenomenal career filled with happiness and success. But what I like to talk about in the now what are three things that a lot of people don't talk about. Number one, arousal levels. Where was your head at the time? Were you high enough to be where you needed to be? Or were you, uh, were you overexcited? so excited you couldn't compete well and then our job later is to teach you to bring down or bring up those arousal levels as appropriate tension is physical tension and you need to learn to light up your body when appropriate and relax when appropriate to me that's the master skill and the final one is where's your heart rate now that is one of those things that many people don't understand. But if your anxiety is driving your heart rate up so that it's actually affecting your physical performance, we need to practice ways to bring it down. The easier one, of course, is if you find yourself at a competition and you need to raise your heart rate, which is miles easier, by the way, folks. I mean, you do a few run in place for a few seconds or maybe go for a sprint. You can bring yourself there. But what's important to me, the most important thing, is to get into the mind of the athlete with the question of now what? Did you line up your tension, your arousal, and your heart rate at the right place so you can compete at the highest level possible? By the way, you still may lose. Other people are doing the same darn things. But did you perform at your best for that day under those circumstances. 
Now, of course, the job from there is to repeat. After the competition, we train appropriately, we work on the reps, we show up, we go again, and we ask those questions, and we're constantly trying to just get a little bit better. So now what, as it says right there, basically you're focusing on what to do next. Uh, sometimes it's actually easier because like if you fail at the Olympic trials or you something terrible happens at the Super Bowl or the World Cup, uh, the problem's right there. It's, it's very clear. Everyone knows um, if, you, if you miss a play or whatever, it, it's visible. It's, it's public. Sometimes it's a little more subtle. So the grid help us, helps us to focus on what's next. So this is the now what grid. So we have health and longevity. Again, Maffetone's definition. Health is the optimal interplay of the human organs. Uh, you get that through going to doctors and blood tests. Longevity is the quality and quantity issue. Fitness is the ability to do a task. And performance is when someone calls your name and you step up and you perform. Now, for this grid to work, there's a couple things I want you to think about. Uh, when it comes to something that you do once or just a few times uh, in the areas of health and longevity, and honestly, it will help you in performance and fitness too, but let's just hold for that. Um, I call it shark habits, and that's one bite and they're done. Um, after a while, you probably will set up a set of rules or even rituals that you'll have. Um, I know a lot of people with their email, uh, the email that comes in, they have certain rules. In fact, some systems can even be taught to do the rules for you. When the area of fitness and performance, that's where you get into things like peaking programs, any kind of plan and really any kind of program. Um, it's not something you're going to do every single workout the rest of your life. You fit them in at certain specific times. And then there's all these things we call these ongoing or permanent things. Um, and we use the word pirate maps, uh, which is basically a concept from Pat Flynn. You give somebody a, a very simple little map and it's St. John's Island with a white coconut tree, take seven paces to the west, dig down and there's your buried treasure. And when it comes to fitness and especially performance, I focus on principles. What are those things that we can do to help us capture first place? Let's look in at these in a little more depth now. Well, in shark habits, it, it really is one bite and you're done. I got this from Rob Wolf. Uh, we were speaking together at a, at a military meeting and uh, he talked about the importance of always travel with duct tape. And the idea is you go into your room, your hotel room, and you, you take little strips of duct tape and you hide all those green and red dots and the, you put the alarm clock this way instead of focusing this way. And who uses a hotel alarm clock in this day and age? Uh, but the idea is the first night I did that, I went in my room, turned the lights off, and I was shocked to see how many little red and little green lights there are. So, but once you do that, you never have to do it again, like at your own home. Uh, when I drive, I always keep floss sticks on the driver's side, little pouch area that's on the, on the door. And I keep floss sticks so while I'm driving, I always floss my teeth. Uh, that way, I don't have to think about when do I floss my teeth. I floss my teeth when I do the commute or go to the store. Uh, I'm very good about the following. If I open an email, I answer it. If I open a letter, I answer it. If you send me a wedding invitation, I deal with it at that moment. So you touch mail only once. Uh, we try to do this with every family tradition we have. And this is where the rituals start to show up. Uh, here in the United States, the day after Friday, uh, Thanksgiving is Thanksgiving Friday, or sometimes called Black Friday, which I've never really liked, but that's the day most Americans go and shop. Well, in our house, it was when the girls were little, it was just this weird little day with nothing to do. So that's when we decided to start putting Christmas up for the year. So Thanksgiving Friday is the day we put Christmas up. We bring the trees out, we decorate the trees, we decorate the home for Christmas. And nowadays, we also, at the end of that setup, we go on the computer and we do this thing called Wine and Prime, where we open a bottle of wine or two and we shop online for Christmas presents. If on Christmas morning you ever open a present for me and you kind of go, huh, that's interesting, you can kind of tell where you were on the amount of wine I was drinking at the time when I bought it for you. 
The most obvious thing, of course, is what we call this here shirt thing. Uh, I own 16 of these shirts because in North America, the day I bought them, they only had 16 of them in my size. I never think about what I'm going to wear because I always wear the exact same thing. When I travel, I roll up a bunch of these. I've got a couple of pair of exact matching pants. Uh, I've got a couple of pair of the exact same shoes. When I travel, I wear the exact same thing every day. And frankly, no one ever cares about what I wear. Let's look at the chart again real quick. So once you have the shark habits down, now let's talk. Now, shark habits are those things that come at you, like emails. You're not going to have to answer uh, generally the same exact email 10,000 days in a row. But there are certain things you're going to have to do day in, day out, day in, day out. And we call those pirate maps. This concept of pirate maps comes from my good friend, Pat Flynn. And he, let me quote him right here. I give the analogy a lot of how a fitness program should be like a treasure map, meaning a treasure map is valuable not because it's 100 pages long. It's valuable because it marks a clear path from A to B, which is great for most people. That's, that's what this is. It's a short, written-up plan, hardly amounting to more than a page, with clear instructions on how to lose 7 to 10 pounds safely in a week. Well, when I heard him say that, I said, you know, it doesn't just have to be a one-week program. I mean, it can be an ongoing big thing, decades long, but there's a big key to it. And as my wife, Tiffany, from the Department of Treasure, Treasury always reminds me, don't over-paper it. Uh, if you ever see the great movie uh, Office Space with the memos, he got the, he got the same stupid memo from eight different people. Um, I have a, well, I don't really keep many more, but I have lots and lots of fitness and fat loss books that are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. And not anywhere in the book does it ever clearly say, hey, do this. Oh, there's recipes galore on how to make gel, low carb jello or some non nonsense like that. But there is no actual do this in it. And it's interesting because when I look at most fitness books very often, it's like diet books. Lots and lots and lots of recipes in uh, diet books. Lots and lots and lots of how to do exercises and fitness books. And when you finish the book, you still don't know how to reach your goals. A couple of years ago, getting ready for the Record Breakers weightlifting meet, I put together this very simple pirate map. My sleep ritual, by the way, it's basically the same for me every day, no matter what. Um, make coffee for the morning. I always wake up to the smell of fresh brewed coffee. I wear blue blocking sun. Uh, glasses after eight o'clock. Uh, at the time I was hot tubbing and ice showering after taking my supplements. I don't do that anymore because our hot tub blew up, which slowed me down a little bit. Uh, I was taking my supplements at the time. I was making sure I got plenty of fish oil and magnesium. And if you have to take any medications, you'd take them then. When I wake up, I try to be great, grateful and I do a few resets, uh, uh, rocks and nods for my good friend, Tim Anderson. The wake up and be grateful is a very simple one, but if you're not grateful when you wake up, why not? And usually your, your quality of sleep was wrong. Well, why was that? It goes back to your sleep ritual. I do a one moment meditation every day on my iPhone. It's a app called One Moment Meditation. Um, and people ask me this all the time, well, why don't you go longer? And I'm always, well, because one minute's pretty good. At this time, I was three days a week, I was doing an Olympic lifting program for my coach, Dave Turner two front squat workouts plus O lifting days. And then the other three days a week, I was just doing long original strength, which is kind of odd to say long. We just talk about original strength, but lots of uh, nodding, and head movement, shoulder movement, hip movements, and some crawling, just to make sure my mobility was where it should be. And of course, my good friend Josh Hillis always emphasizes to me that I should eat eight different vegetables every day. Um, and that's actually getting easier and easier for me to accomplish because I, now that I know it's just part of my pirate map, it also becomes part of my shopping list. Pat Flynn's original pirate map was this. Start your day off by thanking someone or something. Have 20 to 30 grams of protein within 30 minutes of waking up. Occasionally don't have breakfast, just fast. Uh, he has a nutrition rule here, the 100-100-10 rule. 
He calls for strength training three to five days a week. And then I love his line here. And he gets sweaty two to three times a week. Walk more than you ride. Take the stairs. Park farther away. Have a sleep ritual. So important. And the great three lines that I use to summarize programming every time I talk. Train consistently for progress. Add variety for plateaus. And randomness for fun. Uh, when I work with performance athletes, we spell fun, W-I-N. I know I beat that joke to death, but it's absolutely true. My friend Marcus sent me this one a couple years ago, and it's also in his book. And this is his map for everyone. Number one, prevention is better than a cure. I, I tell you, that is an absolute truism about life. Going to the dentist three times a year is better than going once to get all kinds of pus removed out of your face. Number two... Sleep isn't a luxury. Prioritize it. Three, cultivate friendships and be a good friend. God, I love that line. Thank you, Marcus. Four, eat like an adult. Now, he tells you in the book he stole that from me, but I can't disagree with that. Uh, move more often. Make friends with the floor and build strength. Number six, have an effective stress management plan. Oddly, <laughs> what I've noticed in my life, if I take care of my teeth, my vision, my cars, my lawn, my laundry, good shopping, my stress levels aren't that big. And then finally, remember, supplements, supplement. Let's look at another one that I call the three F's for fitness and finance. Uh, remain debt-free, have an emergency fund, save money every month for some distant fortune fund, buy quality goods and services, boy, that's a tough lesson when you're young, maintain your health and proper care and medical and dental checkups, Choose wisely when it comes to matters of the heart. And of course, what I think the most important financial advice I can give anybody, invest deeply in your education and your spouse's education and career advancement. What I'm trying to get across here is that the same truths carry over into every aspect of life. My good friend uh, Vince Tanner added this to uh, our little list here, and I include this in almost every book now. His summary on how to train for powerlifting. The only things you're trying to prove are the squat, bench press, and deadlift. What a great line. Use same but different exercises. Do the big lifts with low reps and train like a bodybuilder for the rest of the time. Have a heavy day and have a fast day. You can never have strong enough triceps, hamstrings, lats, or abs. You may never have to deadlift outside of a meet. That's very true in my career. Back off when you need to. Pirate maps tend to lead to principles, as I've discovered, but we'll continue on for just one more example here. Now, in my book, 40 Years of the Whistle, I begin the entire book with this list of 10, but I'll share it with you again right now. One, constant assessment. Always be looking around, uh, which ties into number two, constant upgrading. Always be checking things and see if you can make things a little better. Ignore perfect, which is... Uh, a hard lesson and a hard thing to explain to people. This isn't moral theology. Things aren't good or bad. They just are. There are no good exercises necessarily. There are no bad exercises necessarily. Hard lesson to learn. Everything works. Uh, number six, achieving a goal versus success. Um, many people get their goals in life and are miserable failures. That's a tough lesson to learn. After the peak, is the cliff. That's, a, that's one you'll find out if you ever do a program. Self-discipline is a finite resource. Uh, everyone I know has a ton of self-discipline on December 31st, yet a few days later, all those great plans they made are gone. This is, a, this is the foundation of whatever, what I believe. Fundamentals trump everything else. The basics are always the most important thing. And then finally, number 10, and I learned this lesson sadly too late. Take a moment to appreciate those who went before you. Let's return now to the grid. Now, what we're going to do, be doing now is sliding over to fitness and performance. Now, most people see fitness as a program. Hey, Dan, uh, just give me a diet. Hey, Dan, just give me an exercise program. Um, fitness is the ability to do a task. So you've got all these programs, like these 90-day programs, two-week programs. I love that one. <laughs> Big arms in 14 minutes. I like that. 
Uh, anytime you see 90, 14, two weeks, overnight, look good for X, it's this kind of junk. Um, peaking programs for sports are like that. Personally, I would much rather we talk about calendars and checklists than some magic formula of 84.9% on this day and 73.2% some other day. Listen, if you throw, show up at the Nationals, you don't have your throwing shoes, that's much bigger than that little percentage you did six weeks before. Uh, this little chart just always makes me happy. Uh, the big problem is what everybody thinks peaking and planning and programming is going to look like is that nice little slow, gentle hill. But for those of us who have ever achieved our goals, and I'm very proud to say that I have, the road is much tougher. In the ninth grade, I told my sister Corrine that I was going to go to Utah State University. I'd like to go to Utah State University and throw the discus. And I asked her to keep it to herself. Well, you know, a few years later, I get a call from Coach Mon, and, he, and it's exactly what happened. Well, isn't that a wonderful story? Well, the time between me telling Corrine and the call from Coach Mon. I mean, it was all kinds of ups and downs and injuries and pain. A lot of loneliness, a lot of sorrow. Uh, a lot of times it had been very easy to quit. I got there, but it wasn't some easy route. So what I do first is we get out a big calendar. Now, if it's an Olympian, we might have to have four to eight years worth of calendars. And the first thing we do is we start Xing out things. Well, I work with a lot of teachers as, as a former teacher, and the first thing I do is get the big one-year in review calendar. And what I go through is I take big yellow X's or big red X's and we'll red out certain days. For example, um, weddings generally are a good day to red X out. Now, certainly, you, you can train on a wedding day. You can do all kinds of things on a friend's wedding day but you probably don't want to do very much. You certainly don't want to compete and miss your brother or sister's wedding. So when you X out, when you do the X out, for a teacher, I'm just spitballing here, but it'd be probably May and June, probably August and September. Uh, if you're an accountant here in the United States, it's probably going to be April, March, you know, those months. Um, I always use the following joke. And if you're working with a typical mom, you just X out the entire year. Um, that's that's supposed to be funny. But what you want to do, if you, if you can make it happen, is take red X out those days where you have to be somewhere. You have to be focused on something else. And boy, I hope there's a lot of them on your calendar. And then you take yellow and you kind of go through certain months that you have to kind of step back and go, yeah, this, this month because I'm an accountant, this month because I do this, this month because it's Christmas, which is, which is just fine. Let's make those yells. You can still certainly train, but you're going to back off. Well, every other day left on the calendar, those are your green days. Those are the days you can go after it. I have some rules for programs. First, and this is probably a little bit obvious, but you have to have a firm end date. Uh, I, I have a program called Mass Made Simple, and I often get emails from people, what, you know, can I do it again after I finish? Well, no. Uh, I've, I read that wonderful book uh, by Bill Bryce on uh, A Walk in the Woods, where he talks about some people, when they finish the Appalachian Trail, they just turn around and start walking again because that's all they know anymore. I think they have to have a firm finish date and at the same time a firm beginning date. You have to have some kind of measurement. Uh, if you can't measure it, don't do it. Um, <laughs> there's a little point I'm trying, I am I want to make here. I've been at many meetings in my life where I've kind of folded my arms and said, well, that's not my job. I'm not worried about it. If you think something's a stupid idea, I have learned to always raise my hand and say, we got to reconsider this. And if I have intelligent points, I need to make them. And the reason I say this is two times in my career, I've sat there with my arms folded going, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And there's been a personnel change and I became in charge of the program I thought was idiotic. So there you go little word of wisdom for you. 
when we get back now, let's look at really what's important on the performance side. When we get to performance, shark habit, stuff that is not your goal. Pirate map your process to get through, but what are we going to focus on? Well, that's principles. You know, when I first met Coach Ralph Mon, he sat, he sat me down and he told me a few things, and I've mentioned them a million times. Make yourself a slave to good habits. Funny how habits keep showing back up for elite performance. He told me little and often over the long haul, and then explained as a discus thrower, I should lift three days a week, throw four for the next eight years. Principles are different than things like value. There's no right or wrong here. Principles come from the same, well, the, the root word of principle is prin, which means first, like in prince, uh, prime, and simple, which is from the same root as capture. So principle literally means to capture first. So this isn't a value judgment. What we're trying to do is find the fastest, most efficient way to get you to your goal. Um, whenever I talk to coaches, I always ask this simple question, what are the three things that you need to do to be successful. Um, when you talk to uh, hurdlers or great track coaches, very often attack with the lead knee. Talk to a famous basketball coach and he said, free throws when tired. In 1931, John Heisman, who's, whose name is on the Heisman Trophy, said the key to American football is to block, tackle, and fall on the ball. He said that in 1931, and it's absolutely the same truth today. For strength coaches, we have two principles. Very simply, are your athletes up to standard? And now you have to come up with those standards, and that's part of the job of both the strength coach and the technical coaches. And then the other thing I have to think we have to look for is gaps. So I use push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded carry. Great. Well, if 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 I just show up and start adding to your program uh, goblet squats because you guys don't squat appropriately and farmer walks because you guys never done loaded carries you should get better because those are your gaps now this glasgow academy example is just amazing i think uh this is a whole little algorithm to walk every athlete you have through uh whether they're strong enough in good enough shape uh, big enough and you just go through the matrix and you keep solving that riddle about how to take this person and make them an elite athlete. Uh, I read a lot about track and field, and one of my favorite things I've ever read comes from Finland, and these are the Finnish male uh, high, uh, jumper standards. Now, interesting, all jumpers. Uh, this would be, of course, triple jump, long jump, high jump, and pole vault. They expect a 16-year-old to be able to squat 200, clean 180, and snatch between 115 and 135. In my coaching experience, I have had a lot of young men at that level, and that's great. But you'll notice something interesting when they jump up to elite standards. A 350 squat, a 300 clean, and a 200 snatch. Uh, one of the things I picked up in my career over and over is that that 234 number, 200 snatch, 300 clean, and 400 squat, tend to be true in so many different disciplines. Now, it's interesting, you know, because elite, elite jumpers aren't that big. You know, they're probably snatching, in this example, anywhere from 15 to 40 pounds more than their body weight. But that's what it takes to be elite. So years ago, I came up with a set of standards for uh, high school uh, athletes here in the United States. Um, and here's my uh, female standards. We call the big silver club. And again, the numbers, uh, by the way, they're in pounds unless I, I note it. And I've had a lot of people look at this and say, well, 70 pounds isn't very much for a female athlete. And I've said, well, how many female athletes have you worked with in the standing press? And of course, the answer is usually, you know, none. Well, my experience is that it doesn't take much in the weight room to change, to test the standard for female athletes. Because most female athletes don't lift weights. And as I say this, I realize that it's changing quickly, but we're still not there yet. Um, that 205 deadlift, that showed up time and again. We got young ladies deadlifting between two, 200 and 275, that it impacted their performance on the field of play. 
Um, these are my uh, charts for boys. Uh, oh, one thing about both of these, I expect you to be able to do all these in one training session. Uh, so we would often set up the equipment. The, the more advanced athletes would actually see how fast that they could get through this. When you look at those numbers and you think, hmm, that's not very much, but you know, if you have, like I sent to the varsity football coach one year, 62 young men who can all clean and front squat 205 pounds, that means the weakest kid in your program is still very strong. Now, I've been putting an asterisk on every single squat because it's important that you kind of keep this in your mind. I'm not necessarily saying how deep your squat, squat should go. Uh, ideally, the young man on the left is that he is just simply coming out and the gentleman on the right, now that's, that's a deep squat, but you have to be very careful about having very, very high squat numbers with very, very poor depth. So you got to make sure you have a standard there and we're all going to have our own. Um, once you get the standards, once you get the foundations, keep everything simple. As I've noted before, Dave Davis told, told us in 1974, that the best shot putters in the world combined the Olympic lifts and the power lifts. Uh, there is nothing new under the sun that continues to be very good advice. Our job as a strength coach then is to seriously just grow the athlete out. Now we're gonna come back to this yin yang symbol in a little bit, but I like the yin yang symbol to explain the concept of the role of the strength coach and the role of the sport coach. Um, we work together. Now, if, if you got an athlete with perfect technique who's very weak, we call that a flat tire. Or, in the United States, it's become very common, an extremely strong athlete with terrible technique. Uh, you'll see that a lot in American track and field at the high school level, where you have a lot of former football, a lot of football players who will claim to bench between 300 and 400 pounds, yet can barely get across the ring with a shot or discus. So when I'm first working with a 12-year-old thrower, I'll teach him something very simple like stretch one, two, three in the discus, a very simple way to learn the discus. And my job in the weight room is to teach him how to, how to lift weights. Uh, 10 years later, we're completely different uh, style of training. We'll be focusing on arousal uh, level training, trying to get them to pick up their arousal and ease off uh, to be appropriate for the competition. We'll be doing high load Olympic lifts. We'll be doing an, uh, advanced recovery techniques, uh, anything we can get our hands on. And we'll be doing nutritional tweaks like uh, cyclical ketogenic dieting and things like that so that when they do compete, their whole body is wired and fired, ready to throw for. And uh, of course, I always have to bring this up, just to ruin everything. Uh, this is a young man who, and whenever I see an athlete start doing double biceps a little bit, I, I start getting a little worried inside. Um, this, this receiver was a very good uh, receiver and then started doing bodybuilding protocols and got his uh, body weight up to 265 pounds. But the problem with being a wide receiver in American football is your job is to cut, to cut. And the human body can only take so much forces uh, to still cut. This led to ankle injuries uh, that I can recall and probably some knee injuries. So you've got to remember, just because you win in the weight room doesn't mean you're gonna win on the field of play. So when you come down to principles, you gotta think these through. Uh, block, tackle, fall on the ball, throw far. That's my principle for throwing. Um, our family motto here, uh, the John family, is make a difference. And my daughters will tell you constantly, it's not where you start, it's where you finish. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. Um, I think everybody should have a mission statement. Uh, it'll allow you to get through, uh, give you some clarity in your life decisions. My daughter Kelly's business, we know that if our clients do not succeed, then neither have we. Well, that's a pretty high banner, but I have to agree with it. So now that we've gotten through the, the grid, now let's jump into the next thing I do with the now what process. We've gone to a competition, we've had a season, we've had four seasons, we sit back and then we say, well, now what? 
what is happening when you don't perform well? And what is happening when you perform well? So let's look now at the next part of the now what process. This is a little triangle I've come up with year, years ago where I combine what I consider the keys to improving performance. Of course, you got the yin-yang symbol in there. Remember, don't have a flat tire. You've got to be as strong as you need to be, up to standard, no gaps, up to standard, and your technique has to be masterful. But there's three other things. Your physical tension, your arousal level, and then, of course, your heart rate. What taught me about this the best was when I learned an important thing. Practice. Let me say this. I don't like the line, practice makes perfect. I don't like all the variations of it. I believe in this. Practice appropriately. So let's look at what I call ape. And ape is a very simple thing. First, you've got to learn to accept the truth, which is to practice appropriately. And number three is learn from the experience of others. I want you to accept the following truth. Now, I was given this workshop one day, and a young man came by who was a, a, a very famous fighter kind of guy. And he sat down in the back, and he listened to this part here, and I could tell he was glued to what I was saying. It was this part that he told me later on changed his career. Accept this. Performance should be better than practice. Better. And there's three options. <laughs> three basic outcomes between practice and performance. A, which I want you to learn to do, performance is better than practice. So if you throw 180 feet in practice and you throw 200 feet in competition, I'm very happy. B, practice is the same as performance. Performance is the same as practice. You'll see that, and people do that. Uh, I imagine in, uh, uh, in uh, music and in, in theater, that's probably what you would strive to do, though it would be nice to see the bounce of the audience. And then, of course, what we see here, C, and this is very common, you have practice here, but performance is less than practice. My ideal model of performance is this. And, and, I, and I believe it, and we use it with fractals discussions all the time. Performance is here. You throw in the discus and practice 150. You go to your first meet, you throw a 165. Good for you. Your practice then, because now you've had the bump, you throw in a 160. You start throwing 175 meets. Great for you. Your practice jumps up a little bit. Now you throw in 170, and boom, you drop a 185 throw. That's what I want you to do. That's not always what happens. There's a wonderful book called Jurassic Park, and Malcolm warns us about this. Poor performance tends to infect practice. And what happens is it's wonderful to read the book because you just, everything just continues to spiral, spiral, spiral down. If you throw 200 feet in training and you go to practice and throw 160, that seems to cut your confidence out. Now you're a 180 practice thrower, you throw a 40, and you spiral down. Um, Crichton's book, Jurassic Park, is such a good reminder about all this. Here's the interesting thing. and um, We call it actually interventions. Um, if you can sit down with the athlete and begin to discuss the three big ones, arousal, tension, and heart rate, Sometimes the athlete can turn and figure out, yeah, I've been leaving it all in the practice field. And very often, they'll turn. This young fighter I, I talked about, I said, I said to him, how do you normally warm up? He said, yeah, I roll around for a few minutes and then we go. And I go, what do you do uh, when you uh, compete for television? He goes, well, I get there about six hours early and I get a massage and then I do hypnotherapy. And he caught himself off about the ninth thing he said he did. He was, so what you're saying is that the next time I should just roll around and get out there and fight? I said, well, I didn't say that, but that makes sense. He went out the next weekend and upset a very famous person, and it changed his career. 
a hard lesson for many, especially American football coaches. Practicing appropriately is not just doing more. More is easy. Appropriate is difficult. Now, the great role of the strength coach is that I think we could actually teach the athlete in the weight room a lot of this. We can teach the athlete, for example, with heart rate monitors or the talk test. That's when, you, uh, when you're training, you can still talk to your partner. We can train them the athlete to be aware of where their heart rate is. We can certainly train them that when they deadlift, they want a lot of physical tension. And when they're relaxing between sets to truly relaxed. And then there's this thing called arousal, which is the mental side of things. You don't want too much arousal and you don't want too little. There was a study that changed my whole career. And it's, it's an old study. Uh, and I couldn't find it to save my life now. But the Soviets, that will tell you how old it is, did this interesting little study of soccer players. And what they found out is some of the players, well, they'll just say something like a corner kick. In practice, they were flawless. Boom, they'd kick it, and they'd do all that magic in the air, and then the guy would head it in and score. But in games, they would kick it, and it didn't look any good at all. They did a brilliant thing. In practice, the heart rate, when they were doing corner kicks, was 90 to 110. In games, it's 172 plus or minus 13. They're not even the same sport. And so what they did is the intervention they had was to get them to get their heart rate massively up and then do the corner kicks. And then pretty soon, the magic happened. So the most important thing uh, I want to get across first is this. What do you practice first? What is the most important thing for you to practice? What is the toolkit to, for us to find out what is key? Well, I came up with a concept called the prisoner's dilemma. For whatever reason, you're only around, allowed three 15-minute sessions a week to do your goal. Interesting, real quick, sideway. Uh, when I asked Josh Hillis, the fat loss expert, he said, yeah, um, those three 15-minute sessions, I would prepare appropriate food. You know, as a discus thrower, I'd say, I'd do a lot of discus turns and maybe some throwing some overhead squats, maybe from snatches. So anytime you come to one of my practices and you see us not doing full turns, you got to realize that I'm falling away from my own prisoner's dilemma. Let's look at what a few other people by the way, there's two questions I like to ask people. One is if you only had three 15-minute sessions. That opens up great doors. But some people, the question is better, um, what are the three keys to success in what you do? I asked a fighter pilot one time, a very famous fighter pilot, and he said three things. He goes, oh, yeah, got that. Speed is life. Hit and run. So once you drop your payload, get out of there. And he said an interesting thing, straight lines, small hooks. In the modern uh, era battlefield, you got to go as fast as you can go. I asked a famous basketball coach this question. He said, offensive rebounds, transition defense, which I had to ask somebody what that meant, and the big one, free throws when tired. Years later, he won this huge thing with his athletes nailing the free throws at the end of the game. And, of course, my good friend Josh, he said, food preparation, food journal, and then simply get stronger. Now, of course, I beat Pareto's law to death, as anyone knows who, who, who hangs around with me. But Pareto was that great Italian economist who noticed that 20% of the peas in his garden grew 80% of the yield. And then he started looking at 20% of this gave you 80% of that. It's 20% of the effort gives you 80% of the results. We've discovered in the, in the system that we're, we're using is that those of us who focus on those keys get as much or more results than those who do a thousand things. What are the three things? What are the keys? Um, Let's just use two quick examples, and we don't have to work very hard at it. 
but I'll, I'll leave these up here uh, for you to, to look at later. But let's just use uh, free throws when tired. Um, one of the things you might want to do with your basketball players is put a heart rate monitor on them. Or you can simply observe them during the games. You'll see a certain sweat and breathing pattern in the games. You have to mimic that heart rate when you're practicing free throws. You can't be standing there talking about Cindy and Sally or Bobby or Bill while you're bouncing and laughing. Number two, what's the tension and relaxation level? Well, you and me making free throws in an empty gym isn't the same as uh, a nationally televised event with everything on the line when you step up. Your physical tension needs to be practiced, either bringing it down, or probably almost universally bring it down, but some even bringing it up. And of course, the arousal level, you're going to have to practice all that noise that goes on while you're competing. I asked my brother Rich, he's a, he was a very great hurdle coach in America, I asked him one time, what are the three keys to being a good hurdler? And the very first thing he said, it's, it's 10 hurdles. You can't win the first three. got to win all ten. He said attack with the lead knee. I like that. And then this one here. Let's talk about this one here for just a moment. He said it's the tenth hurdle. And I thought, okay. No, no. It's the tenth hurdle. Okay. You don't get it. Uh, you can win all nine, but if you fall down the tenth, you lose. You have to practice getting to the tenth hurdle in how that 10th hurdle is going to feel. If it's the 400 intermediate, that 10th hurdle is going to be, you're going to be tired. So with heart rate, he would have his runners do the full, and he could even put up, I mean, you can put a, a piece of tape where the other nine hurdles are, so they just kind of skip over those and put that last 10th one there. But now they've run a whole, almost an entire lap. They're tired. Their heart is beating through <laughs> lactic acid building up. Their stride is starting to fall apart. That's when you practice. Tension and relaxation It's totally different when, the, when there's a starter go, going off and there's a crowd there. And of course, on arousal scale, don't forget, you have other people right here. And many hurdles, hurdlers never practice with people around them. Yet when you're me, uh, I, I hurdled a few years when I was in high school. Not very well. Uh, but one of the weird things about the hurdles is you're getting pushed and slapped and people fall in your lane and crazy stuff happens during the races. You got to practice that. And that's what you need to focus on. I want to add one more thing about uh, this before we move on. This comes from John T. Reed. And I thought this was very important. He says in his book, Success, you've got to correct the correctable. So there's certain things in life you got. This is how tall I am. Now, I could put lifts in my shoes, but okay, but I, can, I don't know if I could perform on platform shoes. Uh, my general features this is who I am. Now, I could change my eye color, you know, uh, by putting contact lenses in. You can't really change the DNA and the original genetics of a child. Home life, you really can't change. Um, I've noticed certain things about my great athletes with their home life. Uh, it seems to help to come from musicians. It seems to help to come, it seems to help to be the youngest in a, in a larger family. And it seems to help a little bit if uh, you've had to uh, work hard to get where you are. But there are things you can improve. You can improve your physique. You probably can improve some hair decisions, uh, your dress. You can move. I mean, if you want to be a sprinter, uh, I, North Dakota might not be the place you want it to be. No offense to my friends from North Dakota, but generally great sprinters uh, sprint in the uh, hotter areas of the world. And of course, you can change your career like many of us have. And as I often tell people, the biggest investments of your life are you and your spouse. And uh, ideally, you make good choices on your spouse. So when we're looking at correcting the correctables, let's just go through the little path we're going to talk about here. First off, find that 80%. Find the Pareto Law. Find the three keys. Find the answer to the prisoner's dilemma. Find the things that actually improve the performance. Then, 
you sit back and say, this is what makes us win in American football, in soccer, in track and field. This, these three things. Now, let's appropriately mess with the heart rate, the arousal level, and the tension level to make the athlete search in just the training environment for optimal performance. Now, if you have too much physical tension, uh, that's actually kind of easy. I got this from Bud Winters, his wonderful book, available again, called Relax and Win. If you've got too much tension, practice loosening up. You can shake out your jaw. Uh, you can shake out your body. You can smile. Reg Park would shake his thighs and then squeeze them. Breath control is very good. Um, it's been around a long time from the yoga tradition, though recently I saw a movie that said it came from the Navy SEALs. So it's been around a long time, but it's four breaths in, four count hold, four count release, four count hold, four count in, hold, out, hold, in, hold. Any kind of focused breathing seems to help bring down the physical tension. And of course, the old standard of heat, put on a sweat jacket, put on a Extra, put on some extra clothes, uh, put on gloves on a hot day, and warm yourself up. Occasionally, people are too loose. Well, that's actually easy if you think about it before you get to the national championships. Uh, you can do a plank. A plank makes you more tense. You can do isometrics. Or I can throw a bucket of water on the back of your neck. Um, in a sport like powerlifting, maybe shot putters, and maybe one or two other places, there might be a need for more physical tension. Generally, the athletes I work with need to loosen up a little bit. Bud Winters taught us that physical relaxation can lead to mental relaxation. So arousal is going to be something that needs to be thought about and trained long before you get the, the competition. Physical relaxation tends to help with mental arousal levels. But of course, there's going to be more because sometimes we need to raise our arousal up and sometimes you have to have the active skill of bringing it down. With train arousal, I have a few things I'd like to talk about. One of my favorites is from track and field, either the one throw competition or one jump competition. With a high jumper, and say like you have 12 high jumpers, and you have really, really good ones, some medium ones, and some who are kind of poor. Well, the competition is this. You turn to each one, is how high do you want to jump today? Now, if you have a seven-foot high jumper who just wants to win the contest and just goes, we'll put it to six feet. I know I'll win at six. Now we have an interesting discussion here. Because... The, the guy who normally says, uh, your five-foot high jumper, who says, I'll take five feet as my best, and makes it, that's an indicator that this young person has the ability to deal with their arousal levels pretty well in practice. One throw competitions, usually get six. That's when I say you only get one. And then I try to mess with you as best I can. I mean, stand up, sit down. I, I may yell at you. I might pour water in the ring. I might do all kinds of things. To, to make your arousal levels go up, and you only have one chance to bring everything down. Um, an interesting thing you can do in many team sports is trade conditioning for um, the completion of a task. And I, I always think of this one. Um, if there's a drill we used to do called the Miami drill, where you did uh, 10 100-yard sprints, and you had to do them at a certain time for everybody, and you only got 30 seconds rest in between. These, these are hard. Well, the idea is after the third one, you tell, if it's an American football team, you tell your field goal unit, field goal team, you got 25 seconds to run out there and line up. If you make the field goal from 25 yards, we don't do any more conditioning today. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Your field goal team, they might fool around a lot when you're practicing this will be the most focused they've ever been. And I'll tell you one thing, after this, they'll be much more focused when they practice. 
because now they have 92 other people staring at them. Make this kick or I'm going to kill you. Well, that's one good way. So you could just, if you're a basketball team, you could just say that, you know, someone who's uh, important at the end of the game, if Billy makes two straight, you know, during a conditioning drill, if Billy makes two straight, we all go home. It'd be interesting if you only had a 12-man team to uh, cycle that through and just see how focused even your backups get at practicing shooting field, uh, free throws. It's the skill of switching things on and off, and it's very important. When it's time to compete, it's time to step up. It's time to get ready to go. One of the things that came up a few years ago in a Michigan football game, it was late in the season, and uh, they were going to line it up for an onside kick. And the announcer said something very interesting. This was the first time all season long in a game they were going to kick an onside kick. It's an American football thing. Don't worry about it. Just listen to the story. They didn't get it. And I thought to myself, you know, wouldn't it be a good idea to practice onside kicks early in the season, in your preliminary games, in your preseason, when the, the stakes aren't nearly as high, so you have a chance, when it really counts, to get it right? So what I've discovered in my life is that I can find strength training movements that match the arousal of the athlete on the field. So we'll just make these up, but if the scale goes from 1 to 10 on arousal and, um, and tension, so a 10 would be uh, sticking your finger in an outlet and getting shocked, and a 1 would be, you know, in a hot tub, you know, drinking margaritas or something. Um, discus throwing is about a 4. You, you don't want a lot of arousal in the discus in the, the hammer, for example, in track and field. What's interesting is that the snatch and the overhead squat are about a four arousal level. So discus throwers have gravitated naturally through through the decades to doing more, more snatches. It's interesting because the snatch reflects what's going on in the discus ring. Shot putters have a much need for a much more higher arousal and even some tension, and they tend to slide over a little bit more to the clean and jerk, which really does need more arousal. Um, when I coach American football, um, arousal levels of American football rise up and down, up and down, which is why I have so many, I train them with tumbling, that literally the athlete going up and down, up and down. Complexes, circuit, circuit training, because the game demands changing arousal levels, changing tension levels. So in the weight room, we want to make sure we train that way. Our training in the weight room reflects what we're doing out in the field of play. Now, when it gets to an area like heart rate, this is pretty easy. If your heart rate's too low, for example, I would say optimum for most track and field athletes, field athletes, optimal will probably be in the 90s somewhere. You've warmed up, but you're still well within, you, you can still easily talk, but you want to have the flow going. Um, if it's too low, you can jump around, do some jumping jacks, do a sprint or two, move around, your heart rate will come up. If it's too high, then that's the tough one. There could be calming drills, catching your breath, practicing doing... Practicing lowering your heart rate becomes a skill set, and I think it's very important. And if you watch professional soccer players you'll notice that the defenders often rest while the offense is on the field. Here's the funny thing about the defenders. They still might be running, but you can look at them and tell they're actively bringing down their heart rate. Um, you could have a perfect training program, uh, depending on your sport, if you just focused on what I call the dusty corners. Um, that's the three, the three little the three little angles of the triangle. Uh, low tension plus low heart rate, high tension plus high heart rate, high heart rate plus low arousal. And really, if you just wanted to do it, let me give it to you right now, you could do have good sleep, 
eat good food, hot tub. You could do power lifts, planks, and presses. And you could do junk, that mindless cardio work on the aerodyne or the treadmill. You know, it's not bad. It's fine. Now, it wouldn't be optimal for a track and field athlete or a football player. But for most of us, that's not a bad way to, to, to get our workouts in. Um, I love the picture there of the hot tub. In the corner there, we have a, 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 a low physical tension and, and low heart rate. You know, you got my friend there uh, uh, drinking tequila in a hot tub. He's, he's going to stay kind of nice and calm down there. Now, if it's safe or not, that's a whole other story. Uh, when it comes to high arousal and high tension, this is the power list. And my good friend Marty Gallagher, who's far wiser than I, would argue the same basic three things. And, of course, typical mindless cardio, which is low, low, low uh, arousal, but high heart rate works well. And here's Marty. Uh, he was he coached Kirk Kowalski and Ed Cohen. Um, he believed in 12-week linear periodization programs, wholesome food, uh, perfect technique, absolutely perfect technique, and what he called third-way third way cardio, which could be like something simple as rucking or heavy hands. Um, he, he would support those, the, the training those what I call dusty corners. But that's perfect for lifting. For the other sports like throwing, football, collision sports, collision occupations, free throws at the end of the game, that kind of thing, you're going to need a, a different template. Elite athletes must master certain things. And the most important is this. The concept that performance is bigger than practice. Once you get that, then we start to focus on what gives the athlete the biggest bang for the buck. And there's a problem. And if you don't know the problem, you actually probably do. Athletes love fatigue. Athletes love to get tired. They love to sweat. They love to lay down the track and go, I'm exhausted. But the problem is it doesn't always work that way. Exhausting your athletes 200 days in a row and not discussing appropriate arousal and appropriate tension. They might be the best conditioned person at the, at the event, but they can't control what's going to make things happen for the best. So what I've always focused on, what I've always tried to help people was something called experience. And the thing about experience, it doesn't have to be yours. It doesn't have to be bad. Uh, I do love these two pictures here. Um, one of the ways I learned all of this was at the Olympic Training Center, and it was a thing that truly did change my life. They taught us this, how to work on teaching arousal, tension, heart rate with a very simple little thing. The, the first thing they asked us to do was write up our best worst lists in our career. Now, what was interesting about this for me is since I was the oldest of the throwers at this one gathering, the, the, the the sports psychologist guy walked over and said, I, I'd like you to look at this because I think you'll find this interesting. And then he looked at my list, which is very uncomfortable, by the way. And he said, it's interesting because the best things that happened in my career were right next to the worst things that happened in my career. I have learned so much from terrible performances. I don't tend to learn very much from good ones. So what we did was this. First, we did the best worst list. And then they asked us to do a very simple thing called the bubble exercise. So we, we took one or two, maybe even three of our bests, and we put them on a piece of paper, put right down there, through 190 at the PC2A championships. You put a circle around it. And then the job was to go and just fill out all the memories, just in words, that came up to you as it came up. My mom and dad were in the stands. I remember my dad taking me to go visit my brother Gary after. Coach Mon told me that I wasn't going to throw the shot the next day, and it kind of bothered me. Um, I remember Tarl running over and going, I'm sorry I missed it. And I remember this, and I remember that. Well, you write these things down, then you circle, and you start connecting the circles. And the interesting thing was this for me. I looked up and I said, it's people. He goes, I know. 
when I perform at my best, it's people. My mom and dad were the stands. My brother Gary, Paul Radani, Tarl, they're people. And then when I looked at the worst moments of my life, usually I was alone. So what are you going to do with this? Well, he told me this piece of advice. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you find yourself alone, go stand next to the, the, you know, the fence and just stand there. So years later at the Pleasant and Highland Games, I'm standing there. This guy walks by and says, what's under your kilt? And I told him a standard one of the jokes, you know, a blue ribbon or something like that. And he laughed and we started talking. Well, pretty soon there was a whole group of people talking with me about the Highland Games and what's going on. And that group stayed the entire day and cheered me on. They brought me food. They brought me water. We talked. Other people came over. I was told later by one guy, oh, yeah, they all say you're the only guy who talked to anybody. It wasn't that I'm wonderful. This isn't a Mr. Wonderful story. I was using them because I knew the secret to my success was having people who cared about me around. Now, maybe for you it's going to be different. But doing these are wonderful, and doing these with your athletes are just amazing. Dick Notmeyer was a master at telling stories. If, if you were underweight or you had a bad day, Dick would stop and say, well, you know, I had a kid like you one time, went to the Nationals, and he would tell a story about how the person turned things around. So this tradition of telling stories is, is being lost. But I think it's a million dollar thing for a coach to have in their pocket. You need stories and stories about people. Let me show you those lists that I did at the Olympic Training Center. Now I've cleaned them up a little bit, but I don't want to see certain names or anything. But these are the, the highs and lows of my life. And as I wrote these down, I'm sorry about my handwriting being so terrible, but it doesn't matter. You don't have to see them. But when I was alone, my life was rough. And when I'm with people, my life uh, expands. Let's talk about getting experience in two different ways now. The first is what we call stealing other people's experiences, what I call the horizontal community. Oh, there's a, quite a group there. So for me, one of the things that helps me, and I, and I do this all the time with my training, is when people come to work with me, I'll say, what do you need to work on? Well, we all need to work on basically everything. So what you'll find is when people come to training with you and you say, what do you need to work on? And they'll say, I need to work on my kettlebell snatch. And I'll say, oh, good. So do I. An hour later, I just had one of the best workouts of my life because I'm trying to help you. That's the horizontal community. That's this way, okay? So that can be your team, your family, the fans. Your friends in social media can really help you out. My social media context just shocks me to say this, how much they've helped me be a better coach, a better human being, and a much better human person physically, uh, whatever group you're in. Um, I call this gathering where we train at my gym an intentional community. We are coming together intentionally to work out. Uh, you're trying to get with people who walk the walk with you. But there's another dimension. So that's the horizontal community. The other one is the vertical community. And I have been blessed with mentors who understood this. Uh, this is my hero, Glenn Passy. And Dick Notmeyer, Ralph Mon were both extraordinary with the following thing. Those sentences that start off to lead into a story. We used to have a kid just like you. And then they tell a story about how things got turned around all for the better. One time, that's Glenn Passy there, when Glenn was at the Nationals, Glenn was so nervous, talk about your issues with arousal level, he forgot how to throw the discus. Well, coach took him into a corner and relaxed him, talked to him, and pretty soon, Glenn got himself back on his feet and then, of course, went off and won the Nationals the next day. Uh, this is one I like to do a lot when it comes to things like the uh, the 100 snatches for the uh, kettlebell certifications. It's going to feel like. So I'm giving you my experience. So when this does hit you, that marathon, mile 20 on a marathon, you've already been pre-warned. 
Another thing we often say is, well, we expected this. We expected bad weather. We expect we ex and all of a sudden the athlete goes, Oh yeah, you're right. We did work. We we worked that one and I'll say, yeah, that's right. We worked that one day where I poured all those buckets of water in the rain and it was slick. Yeah, you, you'll be fine. We'll just do it just like that day. Oh, okay. Remember how it felt, and then you tell a story from their life. Boy, that's 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 the money maker. And then of course sometimes when you stop and you go, you know, we used to do this thing. And you tell a story about an idea you used to do that maybe you forgot about. But for you, I'm going to bring this back because it might be the thing you need. That stories and that's traditions and it all works. So, now what is a sentence, a phrase, I use when I work with just about anybody, but especially athletes. Uh, perhaps they perform poorly. Perhaps they perform really well. The question is now what? And then what we try to do is break apart how we did. Did we have good shark habits? Often, oddly, shark habits got them into trouble because they didn't follow their own shark habits. How did you do on your pirate map? How did we do on our program and the planning for this? I forgot a towel. Oh boy. From now on, our checklist will have a towel. I forgot to change of clothes. It happened to be at the Nationals one time. Um, you know, so you have to smell like it awful for the rest of the day for everybody else. Change of clothes is on my checklist now. So what you do is you have this checklist, you have this ritual, you have these principles that focus on the keys to winning that you picked up either by asking everybody else or doing the prisoner's dilemma. And then from that, the lessons from there, we start talking about appropriate practice. And that's when the eight comes back. That performance should be better than practice. Number two, practice the keys to your sport. Ensure proper arousal, tension, and heart rate training throughout the program. Try to perform with the lowest heart rate you can, try to perform with the highest heart rate you can. Try to have too much tension, so you have to wax on, wax off it. Try to have too little, so you have to build it up within just seconds. Try to have too much arousal, try to have too little. Then finally, experience. Fill yourself with other people's insights and experiences. Know that roadblocks are coming and embrace them when you get there. Um, Life, man, life has problems. It's our job to overcome them. And the idea of now what is to kick the system off again. Okay, we got to be better about arousal, uh, heart rate, tension next time. We thought this was a key to performance, but we were wrong. So we need to focus on this more. I can't believe we didn't practice this thing. I'll never forget that again because I'll make that into my checklist. Folks, that's what now what is. Can you go is what I asked the day of performance. Now what is the massive assessment we do after? It's all about performance athletes, but the toolkit can help you in any aspect of your life. Thank you.